Mike Marmore, a retina specialist from Stanford University and also an, a uh, scholar of vision and the arts. And I established a lecture here at the AAO uh, to deal with ophthalmology in the arts. Uh, it's my pleasure this year to have Mark Foster Gage as our speaker. Uh, uh, he's an eminent architect and also the assistant dean of architecture at Yale. Uh, thanks very much for coming, Mark. My pleasure. Mark, uh, you have noted uh, in some of your writings that uh, ancient architects designed structures to compensate for errors in vision. Um, what do you mean by that? Yeah, well you have to look at the, the idea about uh, optics at the time was that there were these rays that emanated from your eyes and the Greek architects noted that as they built larger and larger temples, for instance, the higher things got up off the ground is that they were looking a little bit distorted and they thought that their eyes weren't able to take in that kind of size of things. So as they started building larger and larger buildings, they started making these very strange little corrections. So, for instance, on a building like the Parthenon, which is from about 400 BC, uh, there's literally not a single straight line on the entire building. The whole base on which it sits curves ever so slightly like a hill. All of the columns actually tilt inward a little bit. All of the columns taper a little bit. And the whole idea was to give it a more uh, dynamic and stable uh, form. Wow. Well, now, some, some modern architecture seems, seems almost to defy perspective. Is there some unifying concept here? Yeah, modernism was a very different kind of project than the, the project of antiquity. It was a much more uh, intellectual idea, much more abstract. So in modernism, it's more important if you see a cube-like building that you picture a cube and know that there's a relationship. So the moderns weren't so uh, worried about how things look relative to vision. It was more interested in how they look towards the mind, how they match the perfect ideas in the mind. But modern architecture is always also interesting because it allowed for things that the eye wasn't necessarily used to looking at. So you'll get large cantilevers without any columns under it, which looks almost like a kind of magic trick to the eye compared to the architecture that we've seen in the past. Wow. Now, perspective, which we take for granted now and was used in ancient times, was lost in the Dark Ages, at least in, in art, not necessarily architecture. It was, it was, was, it was lost in um, architecture for a, a long time. And the reason for that is after the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, there was a rise of Christianity, obviously. And in the Christian kind of building uh, world, it wasn't important what a building looked like to humans. It was important what a building looked like to God. So for instance, on giant cathedrals, you'll have a lot of the sculpture and a lot of the ornament taking place at the very top of the building, like gargoyles. And it wasn't really intended to be something that we saw. Uh, in the same way that when they built um, the cathedrals, they had, they had flying buttresses and all these structural moves. They just left all that as, as it was. They didn't make any attempt to cover it up because again, it wasn't for humans to understand how all of this stuff worked. It was a language of architecture literally invented for God. Wow, interesting. Well, does modern architecture then use or based upon in some ways the optics of the eye, the physiology of the eye, or, or perhaps what ophthalmologists do? Uh, since we're here at an It's interesting, the very meeting. beginning, the very, like the kind of beginning of the Enlightenment uh, is very much the beginning of the ideas behind modern architecture. And they actually did have some translations literally from ophthalmology into architecture. For instance, in about 1800, which is, predates architectural modernism, but it's really about the time of, um, that these ideas started percolating, you start to see these domes, like in the Pantheon in Rome, I'm sorry, the Pantheon in Paris from 1790, that the cross-section of the dome is literally the same as the cross-section of the eye, that you get a series of um, different lenses, but in the architectural translation, they're actually these partial domes and full domes, and the idea was that you're filtering light through this device to make it look holy, so you couldn't tell where the light was coming from. And there's some ideas like that in modern architecture, in early modernists such as Le Corbusier and churches like his uh, Ronchamp Cathedral. You get these mysterious ideas about how light comes into places without knowing exactly where it's coming from. So there's very much a connection between that, that ophthalmology and how light moves into the eye and an understanding of the eye and some of the uh, early architecture experience, especially religious architecture. 
uh, we're here in the great city of Chicago. There's a lot of architecture here. Are there some, some particular buildings or styles that you think uh, uh, perhaps we should look at or take Yeah, notice? absolutely. Chicago is one of the world's great capitals for architecture, um, certainly. I think architecture's, uh, Chicago's greatest contribution to architecture was the skyscraper, and certainly some of the original tall buildings in Chicago, such as the Manadnock Building or Carson Perry Scott by Louis Sullivan, are really significant. I like to see Chicago from either a boat going down the river mm -hmm. or walking around, because I think Chicago is best seen from the outside, looking at all these beautiful skyscrapers that tower above the city. And there's something really incredible about that. The scale is so massive, it's so vertical. But when you go into skyscrapers, they don't generally have giant, beautiful spaces. It's mostly offices. So my, my advice on the best way to see Chicago is from the outside, from walking, from experiencing these towering uh, towers. Well, I guess the uh, space of Chicago makes the buildings rise, and so there's a certain similarity in, in those, and yet then there's very striking architecture in the park, in Millennium Park. Oh, yeah, Millennium Park is really something uh, fantastic. It's, uh, I'm from New York City, and I um, you know, go to Central Park sometimes, but it's a really a totally different idea of a park where it's not just about seeing uh, landscape, but in Millennium Park, there's all these other things to see. There's the uh, Cloud Gate by Anish Kapoor, which is this highly mirrored surface, which is interesting optically because it actually distorts the city of Chicago and kind of flips it upside down. It's almost like what your eye does with light, but doing it on the exterior uh, of the world because it, it really like transforms how you see things. And then there's, of course, Frank Gehry's Banshell and uh, these fountains which spit water and have video installations. So it's much more a park about seeing activities and art than just seeing landscape, which I think is a really unique thing for a city. Well, that's wild. Are, are, are there other aspects about either the visual aspects of architecture or the aesthetics of architecture that you might want to, uh, might want to tell us about? Yeah, I think one thing that's interesting in architecture today is there's really a movement almost back to um, the Renaissance, where we're trying to do things which aren't so obvious, where there's, there's a movement to try to add a little bit more mystery into architecture. So after a 20th century of modernism, where essentially the goal was to be able to see how materials came together, it was a very honest type of construction, you were generally supposed to see how it stood up, and there was a kind of ambition to make it legible to all of humanity. That was one of the overarching ambitions of modernism. And I think in today's day and age, there's a real interest in movies and film and special effects. And I think you're starting to see, especially with digital technology, uh, the interest of, in producing new types of architectural environments that have more of a kind of special effects quality, things that you don't necessarily understand how they're working, but produce dynamic and interesting atmospheres that we haven't seen before. Yeah. Are there some examples? Oh, uh, yeah, certainly. I'm, I have a We'd like the today. Guggenheim in, <laughs> in, in, in New York, where you go around the circle and aren't really yeah, quite sure what's level, but uh, example. Um, there's a lot of work with uh, digital screens and technology and projection. I think you see a lot of it in uh, installation architecture at the moment. There's a really interesting installation in the Guggenheim in New York um, that was a, a, a basically a light cavern, and they did this giant light cavern, and you couldn't tell where the light was coming from. So I think. This, this technolo technology about light and digital technology is it's really in its infancy. It's just starting out in very small uh, areas and very temporary things as experiments. And it's going to start to grow into larger and larger environments. But certainly you can see the introduction of things like screen technologies in places like Times Square. And you can imagine 50 years into the future what cities might be as surfaces become places where you can put images of anything. So, But it's interesting, too, that you have Frank Gehry's uh, uh, freeform architecture on the outside of buildings, and uh, yet the insides tend to be more functional and oriented, although I might say the airport in Paris, where you go up these ramps that cross each other, is a disoriented internal feature. Yeah. I think uh, Frank Gehry is definitely an, an architect of the moment, because yeah. he uh, produces such, you know, he's so interested in reflection and how materials go together and curved surfaces, and it's really about trying to produce a new type of visually vibrant architecture that we'd never seen before. So it is a real original strategy. That's great. Well, you've given us a lot of insight. I really appreciate it. And, My and, pleasure. Uh, uh, certainly, I'm looking forward to hearing your lecture. Great. I'm looking forward to Thanks giving it. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for coming and talking with me. Thank you. Thank you.